Good morning. We're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 17 as we continue our verse by verse study uh, through uh, the book of Matthew. I again am, as I was studying and preparing for uh, today, uh, just reminded of absolutely how practical God's word is for today. There's a lot of people that would look at the word and say, well, that's old fashioned stuff. No, it's not. God's still talking today and he's giving basically the same lessons today that he gave back then uh, to his disciples. And as we study through this passage of scripture, it just reminds me of the fact that Matthew is the gospel that was written to demonstrate Christ as king uh, to mankind. And it's interesting if we think about, you know, his kingship, the things that he's telling us. Uh, we've just gone through a passage uh, in chapter 16 where we saw the transfiguration and we saw the disciples up on the mountain with him, Peter, James, and John. How many of you would have loved to have experienced that? Um, by the way, I want to remind you of a set of verses. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near the transfiguration. Let us draw near into the presence of God. Do you see your prayer life as in the presence of God? Do you see opening the word of God as in the presence of God? Again, I challenge you if you don't, you don't understand what you have in your hand. Okay, we are here to hear from God. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. God wants you to be fully assured in your faith. Okay, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. It's possible to experience the transfiguration, to see God in his glory. But you know, Jesus didn't only talk about those ones on the mountain, they came down the mountain to minister. And we saw that in the verses after that, and Hebrews continues to go on and say, let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Do you realize in order to be a viable, victorious Christian, you need this and you need that. If this is the only Christianity you have, you're missing what God has for you. We're coming in here to be prepared and equipped to go out there and do the work of the ministry. By the way, if you think you can live out there and not have this, you're just as mistaken. As a Christian, you need both. You need time in the presence of God and you also need time out there bearing his reproach. And both are essential for the victorious Christian life. As we think, about the passage that we're going to look at today, it's kind of interesting to me because Jesus the King is going to die. And he's going to tell us a story uh, and accounting. He's going to give us his word in this passage of Scripture. It's something that he's repeating from chapter 16 and verse 21. He told him in chapter 16 and verse 21, now he's going to tell it again. And it's interesting because Jesus understood the slowness of the disciples. Scott Kuyper and I spent a little bit of time together yesterday. We were talking about progressive sanctification. And basically what we were saying is we both agree that we're both kind of slow to get what God says. Scott, does that kind of summarize what we were? And all of God's other children say... Amen. We're kind of slow to get it. I wish when God told us at once, we got it. Let's move on to the next lesson. But we don't. And so Jesus does repeat. And by the way, Peter, that's why Jeff referred to this last week. Peter said, you know, I'm going to spend my life reminding you 
of what's in the Word of God. I'm not going to give you anything new. I'm just going to remind you over and over and over again. Well, I feel like today's a reminder because we just went over this not too long ago. We're in Matthew chapter seven, if you, 17, if you would, verse starting at verse 22. In Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 22, it says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorrow. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute, taxes? He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him. In other words, Jesus said something before Peter said something. What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of the strangers? Peter said to him, well, of strangers, of course. It wouldn't make sense for a king to exact a tax from his own son, especially if that son was still living in his house because he's just taking money out of his house. That doesn't make sense. So, of course, from strangers. And Jesus says, then are the children free, nevertheless. See that word? Going to be very important today. Nevertheless, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, cast a hook, take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, Thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and for thee. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your holy word. Cause us, God, to have ears to hear and eyes that are open to behold wonderful things out of your law. And Father, you're the one that can do that. I pray, God, you would do that for us. For your honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. 22 says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. It's interesting as we think through this is he's going to begin a time in which he is going to spend more time at the end of his ministry with his very own disciples than he's going to spend in the world. He's going to concentrate now on getting some people ready for ministry. It's interesting, Mark says this, that he went with them into Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it, for he taught his disciples. That's interesting. Jesus wasn't at this point in time in his life looking for public ministry. He wanted his disciples to come together. He was going to give them concentrated study in the Word of God concentrated study and he says in verse 22 that the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men now if you compare this to chapter 16 and verse 21 he has just told them that he's going to go as a matter of fact it got a rousing answer from peter remember peter says this isn't going to happen to you and jesus said get thee behind me satan peter you are now the voice of satan Get away. This is wrong. Anytime you say the word of God says this, but guess what? You're not being used of God. You're not being used of God. It's the word of God that is important. It's the word of God that is critical. Again, I say it over and over again. It's the word of God that God promises will never return void. It's the word of God that we need to be enabled with in Ephesians 6 where it says put on the whole armor of God we've got one sword one weapon it's the word of the spirit it's the word of God and we need to know the word of God in order to handle it accurately he says that the son of man is going to go and he's going to be betrayed into the hands of men and he's going to suffer and die now it's interesting he does change from chapter 16 verse 21 to chapter 17 in that he now calls himself the son of man he is referring to the incarnation he is referring to that true man true God person he himself who is going to be delivered delivered into the hands of men it's interesting if you don't know this in your life yet 
This is a very important lesson. If you take nothing else from today, you need to understand God uses sinful men to fulfill his plan. And guess what? He's in control today as much as he was in control then, but he will use sinful men. It's interesting when you read this out of Acts chapter 2, he talks about it in Acts chapter 2. He says, he, he talks about the fact that they are the ones who killed him, verse 22. The Jews are the ones that crucified Jesus, but he was delivered up, verse 23. Before the, before the world began, by the foreknowledge and counsel of, of God. So here's a group of people that are culpable for doing what they did, but it was a preordained plan. Folks, our world is preparing for the time when Jesus Christ will return. And he is using even evil governments to get us ready for when the world will end. And if you don't look at today's world and understand in today's world what's happening is because God is prepping and preparing and getting ready a world for a time in which every nation of the world is going to culminate in, an, in a battle against Israel when Jesus Christ is going to return and destroy them. You don't understand what's happening in today's world. Because we have a sure prophecy and it is coming about and he says he's going to be delivered into the hands of men in chapter 16 verse 21 he told us who those evil men were going to be they were going to be the elders they were going to be the chief priests they were going to be the scribes and so he told us a little more in chapter 16 than he does here but in verse 23 it says and they shall kill him they shall kill him they shall kill him even that, Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The wage of sin is someone has to die for sin. We live in a world today where so many people want to glory and, and, and take comfort in the fact that God is a God of love. And God is a God of love. But God is a God of wrath. And God will take vengeance and enact vengeance. Do you realize on the cross of Calvary, the absolute wrath of God the Father against sin is the reason why Christ had to die. And by the way, they were your sins. And they were my sins. How many of us are flipping about sin? Well, I'm saved by grace. Yeah, you are, because you couldn't make it if you weren't. Right? Anybody who is in this world that thinks they're going to make it in their own laurels, I hate to tell you this, you're not. James says you keep the whole law, you offend in one point, you're... You're guilty. That's the danger of mixing law and grace. When people say, well, I'm saved by grace, but i got to keep it by what I do. Folks, if it's possible to lose your salvation, you will lose it. Because you can't do it. Roman Catholic doctrine teaches that the grace of God is infused into a person through baptism and through uh, keeping the sacraments and the ordinances so that they can then become okay and good enough to then live a life that is pleasing to God. And that's how they get to heaven. They'll tell you they're saved by grace, but what they're meaning is God gives them grace and then they can be okay with God. Folks, none of us apart from Jesus Christ are okay with God. First John 1 says, if we say that we have no sin, we, we lie. We're all at the foot of the cross pleading on the grace of God. But here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. But you know what else the law said? Cursed. Cursed. 
is every man that hangs on a, a tree. He became cursed. Now, if you're here this morning and, 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 and you've never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to show you a passage of Scripture that ought to be very sobering. Look at Ro uh, Romans chapter uh, 2. But Christian, hang on, because I think we need to really keep to continue uh, this study to, to look at this. Romans chapter 2, where the Word of God says in chapter 2, verse, uh, uh, ver verse, starting in verse 4, he says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, Treasurest up. Do you see that word, treasurest up? You know what that means? You're putting it in a box and you're keeping it and you're keeping it and you're keeping it. It's what they tell you to do with your 401k before you retire. Today it was worth this much, now it's worth, now it's worth. He says you're treasuring something up. What are you treasuring up? You're treasurous up unto thyself wrath against the wrath of, uh, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You know what an unbeliever is doing? Every time they hear the word of God and they don't respond to the word of God, you know what they do? They add one more tick to the judgment of God that is coming. They add one more crime. I can remember when I was working at SCI Rockview and uh, we, we were told that they were bringing in an inmate uh, this inmate was somebody who uh, had, I, I forget, but I think it was nine bodies. He, he had killed nine people. Eight of them were since he was in prison. This guy, like, was in a jail cell and he had nothing else to do, so he figured out how to kill somebody else. Why? He was a lifer. He was never getting out, and, and he was just going to be there. Folks, understand something. There are criminals in jail for one murder, and that's one sentence, and there's criminals in jail for, and that's another one, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven. And can I tell you something? If you have never bowed your knee to Jesus Christ based on the authority of God's holy word, you are treasuring up the wrath of God against you. In the day of judgment. Hell is not going to be the same for everybody. There's degrees of hell. And for some it's going to be really bad. And I would submit to you the ones that are going to be in really bad judgment are the ones who have heard the word of God. And said, no thank you. A Christian understands something when Jesus died on that cross and paid your punishment for sin. We know, we understand that there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. I personally believe in my theology because the wrath of God was already poured out against Jesus on that cross that I will be saved from the wrath that is going to, going to come in the tribulation period. And I believe that makes total sense. But can I say something to you? Jesus was not kept from that wrath. That when Jesus suffered and died on that cross, he felt the wrath of God for absolutely every sin that you and I have ever committed past, present, and tomorrow. How can we be so flippant about being disobedient to a holy God when it costs Jesus to go through the wrath of God? And boy, sometimes the church is just so flippant with, bits, with being disobedient to God. How can you do that? How can I do that? That's why Paul said, well, if it's of grace, and in Romans chapter 6, he said, shall we continue in sin? And the answer was what? May genoito, may it never be. 
how should we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? But the realization, friend, is this. If the wrath of God for your sin is not poured out on Jesus, it will be poured out somewhere. And you will not escape the wrath of God. And it's interesting, Romans 1 says that the wrath of God is being poured out right now. Right now in our world. Matthew 17, verse uh, 22, 23, and they shall kill him. And the third day they shall ra he shall rise again. And the word of God says, and he was, they were exceedingly sorrowful. They were exceedingly sorrowful. Luke gives us a little bit of a perspective. In Luke 9, 44, it says, Jesus said, let these things sink into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men, but they understood not. You know, the angel is going to show up at the resurrection of Christ, and they're going to be looking at the grave, and he's going to say, didn't he tell you? Remember what he told you back in Galilee? He'll meet you. <laughs> He'll meet you. He's not here. He'll meet you. If they would have just got it and understood it, and they couldn't grasp it. Why? Well, they were focused on the kingdom. They wanted him to come in and set stuff up and do it now. Straighten out the world. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to straighten out the world. I'm going to suffer and die for the greatest uh, is sin or the greatest need that mankind has. A sinful, desperately wicked heart. And that's the most important thing in someone's life. And so he went to the cross. He focused on what it was that people needed. Someone had to die. Folks, I want to tell you something. The loving God of the Bible is the God of wrath in the Bible. And we are fools to believe that God is love and not fully understand that God is wrath. Because a holy God must punish sin. J. Vernon McGee used to make this statement, just because they t he hasn't taken you to the woodshed yet doesn't mean you got away with it. And I feel sometimes that God's loving kindness sometimes is read as, well, I'm okay. You know how we do that? We use the wrong standard. Look, if you would, keep your finger here. We're coming back. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Paul told us what the problem is in man's heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You know what Paul says? Paul says you're not wise if you look around this room and you compare yourself to what you see. That's the wrong plumb line. That's why mankind thinks that mankind is good. That's why you hear psychology say, well, man is basically good. Oh, yeah? The Bible says there is none good. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none. They have all gone away, all gone astray. It's kind of like the rich, the rich man and Lazarus when, when, when we read about it in Luke 16 and, and the rich man says, I thank God that I'm not like... You know what his problem is? He's using the wrong plumb line. How many of you men at some point in time when you were building something and you needed a straight edge instead of going to the truck and getting the real straight edge. You pick up a two before and you do this. Yeah, that's pretty straight. And you put it down and you make the cut only to discover that there's a belly in the middle of your cutting. You know what the problem is? <laughs> 
you use the wrong plumb line. And you know, sometimes we can feel pretty good about ourselves when we use the wrong plumb line. But now let's lay ourselves along inside the holiness of a righteous God. And you know what happens? Instead of being like that rich man, we're like that poor beggar that does nothing but look up into heaven and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful. Because he's the one that had the right and the correct plumb line. He's the one that was able to see himself. It's interesting that we talk about repentance in today's world, and I believe repentance is a very important part of salvation, but repentance is not really truly seen a lot of times in people's hearts. Sometimes we're sorry for our sin, but we're sorry for our sin because we got caught. Sometimes we're sorry for our sin because someone else is going to hear about it and it's going to be public and it's going to embarrass us. But see, true repentance doesn't make excuse. True repentance doesn't go to God and say, God, I, 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 I know I'm not doing what you want me to do, but, but, but that spouse you gave me. That, they, these circumstances, if you'd have filled my bank account, I wouldn't have robbed you, God. And we do exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. When Eve, instead of taking responsibility for her sin, or Adam, instead of taking responsibility of the sin, he turned and he says, it's that woman you gave me. You know, that looks very different from true repentance. I believe one of the greatest passages of true repentance is in Psalm 51. Look at Psalm 51 just for a minute. And David is crying out. By the way, David, kind of like us, took a little bit of time to truly get repentant. You say, well, why do you know that? Well, the baby has already been born when Psalm 51 is written. And the baby died. And there were consequences. And there were, there were consequences for sin. But... But in Psalm 51, you don't see David hollering out about his circumstances. You see David saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to your, the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cr cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now, folks, don't read too much into that. David sinned against Bathsheba. David sinned against the family. David sinned against the knowledge of God when he acted the way he acted. But you know what David saw first? This is against him. This is against him. When I disobey God's word, first and foremost, it is sin against God. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done evil, this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. You know what David's saying? You're right if you send me to hell. Do you see your sin that way? Or, as a Christian even, do you say, well, I'm not really that bad. You got the wrong plumb line. You're looking at other people. You're not looking at the true plumb line. Because my sin sent Jesus to that cross. Because when I disobey God, somehow, some way, Jesus paid for that. Somehow, some way, some of the pain that he felt when he was crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of that was because of me. And how can I be flippant with sin? He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth. Where? In the inward parts. 
God doesn't want us to just be people who can spout out verses. He wants truth here. He doesn't want us to go to Sunday school and learn all the lessons and be able to spit them back out. That's called lip service. He wants my heart. He wants truth on the inward part. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that my bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquity. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. You know what he doesn't say? Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Thank you. Amen. Now, do we need forgiveness? Absolutely. But that wasn't enough with David. David said, God, change my heart. God, do, do, do radical surgery in my life. I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to be what you want me to be. And he keeps going, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time, but get down to verse 17, where he makes this statement. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I'm going to ask you a question. When's the last time you were broken and cried out to God because of who you were? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. God will never despise. God will never turn us away when we come to him broken over our sin. But many times that's not the case if we're honest. Many times if we're honest, we, aren't even, we don't even care about our sin unless somebody hears about it. As long as it's secret and nobody knows about it, I'm safe and I'm okay. No, you're not. There's one who is omniscient and he has already seen it. And it matters. It matters because our testimony is destroyed many times by how we live. In verse 24, it's interesting in that context that Jesus says, then gives us this story. Remember, Scripture is inspired of God. There's a reason why verse 24 follows verse 23. It says, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, doth not your master pay tribute? So they come to Capernaum. That's the place where Jesus spent a lot of his time. And as he comes, there's some folks coming and saying, does, does your master pay tribute money? Now, tribute money was a half a shekel, a double drachma, however you want to say it. About two days' wages, Exodus 30 tells us what it was. It was known as a temple tax. It came from Jewish law. It wasn't Roman, but the Romans certainly did approve it because no one could collect money in a Roman province if Rome didn't agree to it, right? So it was a tax that was being collected, and it wasn't being collected by the Moki, the, the tax gatherer, Matthew was a tax gatherer. He was a Moki. He was an employee of Rome. This wasn't being collected by the Moki. This was being collected by the, the, the leadership of the Jews, and it was put towards the temple. And by the way, everybody paid the same amount. Rich or poor, you paid two drachmas. It was a requirement of the law, and it was something that was collected. And so this tax gatherer comes and he says, well, doesn't your leader pay tax? Now, folks, this is something that's under attack today. There are groups that are saying our citizenship is in heaven and therefore we are not accountable to the government and we don't have to pay taxes and 
we don't have to do this and we don't have to be do that. I want to remind you that King Jesus is the one we're studying right now. And King Jesus is the one that in Romans 13 says, turn there, I want you to see it. I want you to see it, Romans 13. Because I, I, this is one area that I believe is under attack right now, and I, think, I don't think Christians are taking it seriously. 13.1, let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of what? The powers that be are ordained of who? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of who? Wow. You choose to disobey government based on this verse. What's the truth? What does God say? Bring captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, if we were doing a study, we'd go to Acts and we'd say there are times for civil disobedience. But the times for civil disobedience is only when the government tells us to do something the scriptures tell us not to do, or the government tells us not to do something the scripture tells us to do. And they are the only times that we are to not follow government. It's even stronger in 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and again, I'm reading scripture, folks. So this is God. Amen. By the way, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he deals with society. He deals with employment. He deals with the family. He deals with the church. And in every one of those situations, he talks about being subject. Being subject. And in this passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this in, in verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of, what's the very next word? Hmm. Hmm. Keep reading though. For whose sake? The Lord's sake. Do you know wearing a seatbelt should not be an option to a Christian? You might not like it. This verse doesn't say you need to like it. This verse says you need to obey it. And this is God. It's interesting to me, and Mark's going to deal with this tonight, in 2 Peter chapter 2, and if you would look at verse 10, where the Word of God says this, and by the way, in 2 Peter chapter 10, we're starting a study in which he is giving to us the characteristics of false teachers. The characteristics of false teachers. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and do what? Despise what? Government, authority. False teachers are going to be out there saying, you don't need to listen to that. Satan in the garden said, I know what God said, but you don't need to listen to that. And if you want more, come back. Mark's going to deal with it tonight, at least verse 10, because that's where he's at, right? Go back to second or Matthew chapter 17. And then when they were come to Capernaum, they that received uh, tribute money came to Peter. It's interesting they came to Peter. I don't know where Jesus was, but they come to Peter. And, and they say, doth not your master pay tribute? Now, uh, if you study the timing of this text, it's, it's not the due date. So Cheryl's tax office is not wall-to-wall -wall people yet. Okay, but it's coming. Okay, so these guys aren't saying pay it today, but they are asking, does he pay tax? Does he pay tax? And they come to Peter, and look, if you would, it's interesting to me, in verse 25, he said yes. Do you realize how quick he said that? 
Do you realize why he was able to say that that quickly? Because Jesus was known as someone who did what? Paid tax. It was not a question with Peter. It was not an option with Peter. Peter said yes. Apparently Jesus was in the habit of doing exactly what he said. And so he said yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus, the word in the King James says, prevented him. In other words, he preceded him in the discussion before Peter was able to say anything. Jesus comes up and he gives this illustration. And by the way, as he's doing this, he's demonstrating his omniscience. He apparently wasn't there when the question was asked, but he knows exactly what the question was. Okay? And so he comes and he says, Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? And he's going to ask the question. You know, if a king is, is ordering uh, people to pay a tax, who, who, who pays it? By the way, this is a temple tax. And the temple was for the worship of God, Jehovah God, and Jesus is the son of Jehovah God. Don't miss it. He's not just out there randomly speaking. He's setting something up here. Okay? And, 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 and so he's, he's really getting them to think. And, and he says, who do they ask to pay tax? And Peter in verse 26 says, well, the children are free. Okay, what's the inference? Jesus, as the Son of God, was free to not pay if he didn't want to, since the temple was a place where worship of Jehovah took place. God was there. It was his house. After all, we've already seen in the scriptures that the temple was his temple, Malachi chapter 3. It was the Father's house, John chapter 2. And Jesus says, well, I'm free to pay or not pay. Look at the very first verse of 27. Nevertheless. Do you know, Christian, we are not here to live in our rights. We are not here to live in our freedoms. Paul said, in, every th in many things you are free, but do not ever take that freedom and use it as a liberty to cause somebody else to stumble. The moment I live in such a way in the freedoms that I have as a Christian that I cause other people to stumble, I ought to reevaluate how I'm living. He's already told us that in Matthew. He said, if you really want to save your life, here's how you do it. You... Lose it. You lay it down. You don't live for self. You don't live for you. You live for others. And the greatest example of that was Jesus. He didn't come to be ministered unto. He came to minister and to give his life a ransom. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know people that left churches because they were not ministered to? You know, that flies in the face of what we ought to be doing as a church. What would happen if you walked through that door saying, who can I minister to today? I'll tell you what would happen. If ministry didn't take place, it would be your fault. And yet that's exactly what God wants in this service. God is looking for a body who will take their spiritual gifts and pour into each other's lives so that we would become more like Christ. Every member actively working. Not just sitting. Jesus says in verse 27, notwithstanding. Now he's going to give the reason. Lest we should offend them. You know what is in Jesus' mind as he's answering this question? I got to be careful I don't offend them. 
And it's interesting that the word offense is the idea of, of scandalizo is the word. It's the word we get scandal from. You know, there's a lot of Christians in today's world that really don't care about scandals in the church. As a matter of fact, they're part of it. And they're content with it. Boy, if I can just create... Jesus said, lest there's any scandal. One writer wrote it this way. Although, although this was for the support of the temple services, it is certain that the hypocritical and corrupt Jewish leaders disappropriated a large part of what was collected. It is even more certain that the taxes Jesus paid to Rome were used for many ungodly and immoral purposes. Did you ever hear a Christian say, well, I don't, I'm not going to pay my taxes because they're going to use it for... You know what? That was true in Jesus' day. And Jesus didn't say, well, I'm only going to give 10% of my tax because they're going to use 90% for... No, he, he did what? He paid it. He went on, to, this author goes on to say, regardless of how unjust a tax is assessed or how blasphemously or irresponsibly it is spent, it is to be paid. If the Son of God claim no exemption for himself in paying taxes to the den of thieves, remember? To the den of thieves, run by the wicked false teachers and leaders of Israel, how much less can his followers claim exemption for themselves? Jesus had a right to say no! But lest I cause a scandal. Unless I offend them. Look at Acts 24 and verse 16. This is interesting. The Apostle Paul's life in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. Paul makes this statement. And herein do I exercise myself. It's, it's the Greek word gymnazo. I go to the gymnasium. <laughs> I build myself up to do this. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God. Okay, we get that. And toward men. Paul said, you know what? I, I can't live for myself. To the Jew, I became a Jew. But he didn't just do things Jewishly. He did it to win a Jew. To the Gentile, he became a Gentile to, to win the Gentile. I become all things to all people that I might win. Do you realize based on that verse that the way we respond to some things in our life, whether we can justify them or not, we offend people. And it is used to not hear the gospel. This is evangelistic, folks. How we live is evangelistic. When people look at me and see my attitude towards government, it's evangelistic. Because, folks, we've got a world of people out there that struggle with government. Amen? But you know what the sad part is? We have people who call themselves Christians who are out there demonstrating against government. Wow. Keep reading. In verse 27, he goes on to say, Nevertheless, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea. Go thou to the sea. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to Peter. What, what did Peter do for a living? Fish. Go to the sea. Cast a hook. You know, a lot of times when you read about Peter and he was fishing, he didn't use a hook. He used a net. Jesus said, nope, why don't you throw in a hook? One hook. One hook equals one fish. You see it? What's Jesus doing? 
He's supporting the fact that he is who he says he is. Okay, he's not saying go out there and catch a whole bunch of fish and see if you can find a, 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 a coin. <laughs> he says, I want you to throw in one hook. He says, when you throw in that one hook, then you take out the fish, one fish, one fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That piece of money was enough. It was actually four drachmas. It was big enough to pay for him and Peter. Do you ever think of the implications of that? What all did Jesus have to do in order to get that one fish to bite on that one? By the way, he didn't tell us about any bait, did he? Now, I'm not going to surmise. But it's interesting. He said, throw in a hook. And you'll catch one fish, and in that fish, here's the money, go pay our taxes. Go pay our taxes. By the way, what he doesn't do is he doesn't catch enough fish to pay taxes for the 12. He caught enough for him and Peter. But I'm, I've got a hankering to believe that the other guys went to the bank and got money out of their savings account and paid the tax. Folks, it's challenging to me because we live in a world that many times as Christians, I do not believe that we're thinking. And Satan is happy. And I mean thinking, I mean thinking scripturally. Do you realize, I was just talking about this with Jeff, do you realize God talks about whether you eat or drink? Do you actually go to the restaurant and stop and say, okay, I'm eating as to the Lord? Now, I'll tell you, I'm not the best example. I'll tell you that. But you know what else he doesn't let out of the equation? The way we dress. Hair. Whether or not you cover your head when you pray. How you pray. How you worship. What you offer. The use of your time. The use of your talents. I mean, he covers every aspect of life in the scripture. And we're to do it all to the glory of God. Christianity has nothing to do with one hour Sunday morning. Christianity has to do with whether or not we're going to follow Christ. And it even involves whether or not my tax check gets to show on time. Because God doesn't let it out of the equation. Why is that so significant? Now here's why. Because one of the ways in which Jesus wants people to come to Christ is he wants them to see our good works... And through our good works, he wants them to glorify the Father. I don't know why my family doesn't come to Christ. Have you ever looked? I'm not being smart. Have you ever looked? Because in Titus, it talks about living in such a way that, that, that we bring blasphemy to the word of God by our actions. Because we don't live the way God wants us to live. Daddy, you got an incredible responsibility. In the Old Testament, it was called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength and talk about it when when you rise up when you sit down when you go to the wayside wherever you are bring Christ into the picture I wonder if maybe sometimes our families have people that we don't even bring it up on Sunday morning 
we take it, them somewhere where someone else will bring it up. And our own kids have never heard out of our own mouth the significance and the importance of Christ. No wonder we're weak, right? But don't lose sight of the fact that many mundane things out there in that world, eating, drinking, the way I wear, what I wear, how I wear it. You know, I often say clothes are not an attractant. Although that's how people buy clothes today. This is attractive. Should you be attracting people to your body? Or should you be wearing something modest to cover up your body? Because that's, why the, re that's the reason clothes were given. Am I thinking biblically? Am I living in such a way that Jesus Christ gets honor and glory? You know where it begins. And it gets back to Matthew 16. If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. Are you following Jesus today? Father, thank you for the truth of your holy word. Cause us, God. Cause us, God, to bring captive every thought to be those who look at your word for the answers to how we're going to respond, how we're going to react, who we're, who we're going to say what to. Lord, you even tell us no unwholesome word to proceed out of our mouth. Lord, every idle word is something that someday we'll stand before you and give an account. Oh, Father, I pray that you would glorify your name as we think about the sins if we're believers, to think about the sins that we've committed that are against a holy God. And Father, may we be broken and contrite. And Father, if we're not believers, to understand that the wrath of God is being treasured up, stored up to a day in which we will bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and we will confess that he is Lord and we will stand in judgment because of what you've, you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you get the glory you deserve in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind the elders.